Glow no word thing, nigga. That's the motherfucking movement. That's what we running with. That's what we stand for. Uh -huh. Shit, whether it's movies, TV no shows, we trying to go global with it. What's going on, everybody? It's another episode of Global Everything TV. First and foremost, I want to thank y'all for tuning in. We got another special guest, but before I get into this special guest that we got right here, make sure if you're checking this out on YouTube, you hit that like button and that subscribe button down below. Like I said, we got another episode of Global Everything TV. Today, we got another big, all-time special guest. This person, I look at as a pioneer, a legend within the city. She's been around for years. Like, when I first picked up a mic, I knew who Mona J was. And, like, even if you don't know none of her music, for me, with none of her music, I'm sure y'all know her name. I'm sure her name ain't ring bells. Anywhere you go, you ask who, they know her. They know her. So, out of all the other females that I interviewed, this person been around for some time. Like, she's the OG in the game. Like, she did countless amount of songs with a lot of artists within Richmond and outside of Richmond. She got videos on YouTube. Make sure y'all check her out. She got the 804 Music Group. Without further ado, we got Mona J that we'll be interviewing today. How you doing today? I'm good. So we're going to get right into it. When did you start getting into music and what led to that point? You remember that? Um, the very first time I stepped into a studio, I was 16, so that was in 96. Um, I was in a group called Charade, which was, um, started by a guy named Sam Licorice. Okay. Um, you want to know more? Or <laughs> yeah, definitely. Keep going. All right. Um, but basically there was a girl in my class in high school in Manchester and, um, she was telling me about a group she was in called Charade. And she told me at the time they had three other singers, um, including herself. And I think one of the girls had dropped out the group, so they needed one more person. So um, she introduced me, introduced me to Mr. Licorice, and um, he ended up taking us to the studio, which was Kick Him to the Curb, mm -hmm. and got a chance to see what my vocals sound like in the studio. And I've been hooked ever since. Right, what year was this? Your remember? 96. 96? Mm-hmm. Damn. So... How much would you say didn't did change, like, for you from 96, now we're in 2016, down there 20 years later? How much changed? Um, the positive changes has been having the internet mm -hmm. to um, get my voice heard and to be able to check out other artists that are also um, in my field. Yeah. And, I mean, basically, that gives you an advantage you know, because you get to check out your competition and create competition and um, you can expand as far as you want to, um, especially like we're having Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the negatives, um, um, I would say how it change the negatives of it is like, I don't know what the hell these artists are talking about. <laughs> I just don't know what they're talking about. I can't understand. I can't relate. The beats are dope, but I can't really... And they're just not taking the time to focus on their, their lyrics and their rhyme scheme and their delivery and, you know, being able to um, be diverse with their vocals and using their vocals as an actual instrument. I don't feel like a lot of artists know how to do that. So I, I would say that that's how it changed because back then we knew how to do that. And now it seemed like they just want to, I mean, I, well, I can say because we wanted to do that too. We wanted to push the vets out the way because they weren't helping us though. But I, we felt like, you know, if we push them out the way, we can come in with a new sound. So basically that's what they're doing to us too. They want to push us out the way and bring in a new sound. But the new sound is crazy. The only people that's really like making it sweet is the, the producers mm -hmm. for real. So that's the negative in it. Who was your com some of your competition coming up in 96? Because I can't remember too many artists off the top of my head in 96. You remember? Like some of the people you were competing <laughs> with? Well, locally or... Yeah, yeah, locally. Okay, locally, I can't really remember anybody back then that was pushing as hard as I was. Because, I mean, I, at the time I was with DUC, and uh, we had Mahogany. She was pretty dope, but her... She rhymed too, so she was just different. So I didn't feel like she was competition. She was more like an asset to our team. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't really remember. 
anybody that was doing it you back was in then. The lane all by yourself, class all by yourself, pretty much. Yeah. So what about some of your influences? Who who influenced you to want to do music early on? Um, as far as locally, Sean Chappelle was one of the people that um. Because she was like the first local that I saw that was really, really doing it. I mean, because, I mean, Super Friends was doing it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I remember seeing a CD being pressed up and I didn't know anybody else who had that. And um, having hits like that that actually be played on the radio, stuff like that, I went to sleep to a few of her songs, you know. So she was one of them. But then as far as the major artists, I would say Lauryn Hill, um, Erica Badu, back, 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 first, first coming up, I'll say probably like Mary J. Blige and um, probably Whitney Houston was a, you know, a big icon for me. Um, I couldn't hit her notes, you know what I mean? Because I was more of a Mary J. I have a raspy alto voice, so, you know, I had to work with what I had. But um, Aaliyah, I liked Aaliyah coming up. I liked TLC coming up. Um, Total, most of all of the 90s people that was out there doing anything, I liked them. Um, I liked Mariah, some of her songs. Um, people like that. How creative would you say you are with the, with the hands-on process of your music? Um, like, how much do you put in for yourself? Uh, do you have, like, a team of people helping you write sometimes, or you do it all yourself? Well, I've had people to come in because I can't figure out what I want to put in there. I'd be like, I just can't come up with that. Mm -hmm. Writer's block. So now um, I'm all 100% by myself. But in the past, I've had maybe Army Black help me. Um, Shamu has helped me. My homegirl, Tony, from around here. So a few people. But more majority of all my music from the past was all by myself because I'm a loner. I tend to just find good spaces to be in and write, so. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. But if I get stuck, I won't hesitate to ask for help because I don't feel like no artist is bigger than, you know what I mean? Like, what's really out there for you? Because a lot of people have other ideas that you might not have, so. Yeah, it's all about mm -hmm. putting out that dope music. You mm -hmm. take the time. You do what you gotta do. What would you say is your biggest song that you had to this date? Mm, probably Paper Chaser. Yeah, everybody, especially in the club, especially when I go out of town, a lot of people, you know, they've never heard of me. And if I rock that out in my show set, they be rocking and rocking and rocking. You remember that whole recording process of doing that song? <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, but um, I was working with Red Eye Entertainment at that time. I was. 29 and I remember asking um, for some beats and I got that track and it just came to me like I was at my dad staying with my dad and it just it just came to me and um, I ended up calling my girl Juju and was like yo I need you to hear the song like and tell me what you think and I think I ended up posting like a whack ass video on um, YouTube just trying to show people <laughs> what I was working on or whatever, and people was rocking with it. I got like a thousand views quick, so I was like, okay, so I think I need to take this down and go ahead and finish it up and put it all together, yeah. But I ended up um, recording with him, and he was so amazing because he could like, like you know how some people like wait till you leave to mix and master your work, and then they'll send you a copy, and then you gotta listen to it, and then you'll like it, and you gotta go all the way back to the studio, yes. Like he was one of those type of people that he could get it done right then and there. And then melodies that you might have just, because he'll just record you. So like melodies you might have missed, you know, he'll pick it up. His name is Marco Wood, but he would like pick it up and then he'll put it there. And then he'll put this piece there and then he'll tell you, nah, do it like this. A lot of producers won't do that with me when they're sitting down and engineering me, they won't do that. But that was a great process because it came out to be really good, especially for us not taking it all the way and like getting it mastered and all of that all we did was mix it and I was just like so thirsty to put some music out there like soon as I had that first official mix that sound excellent I threw it out there like mm, yeah. see what people say and it did good and the video did good too
What about the MySpace era? I know you got started doing the MySpace era. What, what you remember the most about MySpace and putting your music online? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Because, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm, like, in the streets, in the streets, like, going here, bang, 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 bang. Like, I'm not one of them, but didn't really have computers and access to computers like that. So I was kind of street when it came down to learning the Internet. So um, when I got with um, Corporate Hustle Entertainment with Phil, um, he built my MySpace page for me. It was a part of my package of him being my manager. And um, ended up, like, I guess hacking it. I got my brother to hack the account so I could have full control of my MySpace. <laughs> and then I just started posting whatever I wanted. So every time I hit the studio, I would upload it and put it on there. Um, I had a lot of followers on there. A lot, a lot, a lot. I want to say like 30,000 when people won't really have it, like 30,000. Mm -hmm. So, and just was going back, looking at the views on the songs. I'm getting like 10,000, mm -hmm. you know, because they got to listen. So it was like the listens was up. And I was like, damn, like how can I like utilize these people? Like they like the music, but I don't know how to get them to, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I didn't know anything about iTunes. I don't even know if that was even out then. I just didn't really know that much about the internet. But my MySpace, and I ended up creating a second one, and my MySpace was popping. And I ended up meeting, like, um, Walker's brother, Wu the Kid, on there. I got cool with him, and K.O. Red, his little brother, rest in peace. Ended up meeting him through MySpace. Um, Chopper Young City, met him through MySpace. Project Pet, you know, when I met him, we was on MySpace first before we reverted over to Twitter and everything else. But yeah, it was pretty dope interacting with those po those folks on there, especially being a local artist and only my city know me, you yeah, know? True. Yeah. So how you felt when, it, when MySpace kind of fell off the earth? I didn't care because, look, because Lonnie B was like, <laughs> I seen Lonnie B at the Canal Club one day and he was like, Mona J, you still on MySpace? <laughs> And I, over. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> and um, I ended up getting a job at Best Buy, and I bought my first laptop. So um, he was like, yo, you need to get on Twitter. Like, that's where all the artists are. And I was like, dude, I'm not going to know what to do. He was like, just start your account, and then just tell me, and I'll follow you. <laughs> and so it was an easy transition, because once I got hooked on there, then I found out about Facebook. <laughs> Yeah. So it was like I took off from there. It was like, oh yeah, I'm on. Because everybody was like wanting to add me. You know, it was pretty dope. And people really was listening. You could actually see the views on there. That was pretty dope. Yeah. So I think I think it went on Twitter. How was the conversion from Twitter? Yo, Twitter people? changed my life. Because I know I'm sure you connected with a lot of people on there too. Yes. Video, yeah, it really did for the good. It changed my life because um, my very first follower on there was Juvenile. So I thought that was pretty dope. And um, my second follower was um, was Project Pat, and then my third was Juicy J. And Juicy J really don't follow nobody. So to have his official, and I knew right away about people being verified because of the blue seal that used to be at yeah. the top of them or whatever. But I thought that was pretty dope that um, that they were following, even though they probably don't ever see any of my posts. It was just the fact that they were following and I could brag about it. You think it was the music that made them follow you or you don't know? I, don't, I, I think I because I was connected to Pat. Okay. I don't, But I don't know if Pat ever talked about me to, to Juicy J. So... I, I can't really say. What's some of the advice Pat might give you? I know y'all had some real dope conversations. Yeah, man, he is dope. Um, when I first met him, um, the very first bit of advice he gave me was to create a whole lot of mixtapes and to try to get as many major DJs like DJ Real, DJ Scream, to get behind it. And try to find um, the best producers possible. Go ahead and pay for my shit. And get these producers on deck that can actually help promote and push me a little further. So that was the first advice he gave me. 
And the rest of it was kind of more so just the day-to-day -day stuff that as a local you find out, you know. So I know you didn't connect with a whole lot of people in the industry. I'm going to just name a couple artists, and then you're going to say whatever come to, come to your head first when I name that artist. If I name somebody you want to say next, you can say next too. Right. <laughs> okay. They did you dirty or some shit, you know what Okay, I mean? okay. Right, so. I mean, majority of them did, so. <laughs> I mean. Pastor Troy. Um, not who I thought he was going to be. Okay. You on job? <laughs> Funny as hell, and he's super cool. Marlon Wayans. <laughs> Fine as hell. Zazzilla. <laughs> Fine as hell. Walker. Uh, <laughs> nothing really comes to mind. <laughs> what about his brother, Woody Kid? My homie. Alley Boy? He was cool. Project Pat? He cool. Turk. He cool. How helpful would you say the DJs and promoters have been as far as pushing your music? <laughs> um. <sighs> you got one that's like that help you the most yeah. throughout your career. Uh huh. Um, DJ Vibes. Okay. Um, DJ Party Boys. Um, DJ L O N S. Um. I don't really want to forget nobody, but it's a whole lot of them from Richmond. It's a lot of them that I feel like could have more. It was more so like because I'm known, they would speak and be like, oh, I'm on a J. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But then when it come down to be like, yo, I need to get your music, stuff like that, I send it to them, but I don't know if they show love or not because they don't show love. Yeah. You feel me? Like, if you, I've had DJs actually, like, send me stuff on Instagram, tag me, and they let me know that they really supporting the movement and things like that. And that's what I can say about a lot of them um, that I did name. So, but yeah, for the most part, I'll say the DJs have helped me, especially the ones that are out of town. They really, really helped out a lot. Have they gave you any advice, too, as far as your music or the creative process or just constructive criticism to help you as an artist? Um, I would say, not really. Okay. But I will say one thing I did learn, though. I did learn that it's easier for you to start putting all your music on flash drives and when you're out in different cities, to go ahead and give the DJs, like introduce yourself to the DJ, let them know where you're from, and give him that flash drive so he can have an opportunity when he has time to listen to it. And then if he fuck with it, then he'll hit you up. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've had a lot of DJs hit me up that way. That's how I got a lot of my out-of-town shows because they'll tell the promoters, like, hey, I got a girl named Mona Jade. It's out in Virginia. You know, she's pretty dope. I mean, she rocked it at the event that I was DJing. And, you know, she gave me her music. Everything was, you know, mixed, mastered, and ready you know, show, show ready material, stuff like that. And so once they already had my music, it was easier to just go and rock out whatever set, you know, that I left with them. So I definitely say, if you can do that, do it. I know you probably be trying to, especially if you don't have a whole lot of money. I know you're trying to save money. I know you don't really want to spend it on that, but if you can get you like a two gig, you know, they'd be pretty cheap. You know, if you can get one gig and just fill it up as much as you can, maybe put two hot singles and a couple pictures, you know, maybe your album work or something like that so that they can, you know, come back and if they want to promote it, they can promote it for you. That's game right there for you yeah. guys. You probably mm -hmm. gonna buy a bulk of them on eBay or something too. Mm-hmm. What would you say is one of the craziest messages is, that you might have got from a guy on girl on social media? I know you didn't got a whole lot of crazy messages since you first started doing music and stuff. A wild request or... Uh, uh, Somebody said something crazy out the way to court you off guard. Um, well, most of it's sexual, so you know, cause they be infatuated, and a lot of them be real fans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had a guy ask me to hit him with a strap. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was like the craziest one, and I've had you somebody. Put him on this is a new one. Okay. This one just was. I I just yeah, screenshot it. I'm definitely about to post it though, <laughs> cause that joke kind of messed me up for a second. I was like, 
I couldn't even respond. Like, I was like, that shit just happened. And I have to let people see that this yeah. shit really happens. That's why I post the stuff that I post. Like, you were a known person though, somebody. But it's people. weird. Like, you don't even know me. And yeah. you feel me? Like, I've had um, people tell me that they're willing to do pretty much anything that I ask them to do, spend all their money on me, and they be having a whole family. And they be like, why? <laughs> I'm just me. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Mm. So you really, you really are dealing with like, wait, like you really go through a certain level of real, real wild, life fame, fanatic yes. type people dealing with you, right? I've been, I've been out eating and have people just walk up to me and want hugs and hey, Mona J, and I don't know them. Yeah. Like I don't know them, I don't be knowing them, and but I'm I'm very friendly, you know. I'm until you're rude, I'm very friendly. Like so, I'll hug you back. I'll take pictures. I'm really good with that. It's just it's weird because I'm like, I was born and raised right here in yeah. this city with you guys, and I've worked probably everywhere in Richmond and. I have promoted probably every club in Richmond and I've performed at every club here. But in my mind, I don't understand. Like you don't I don't think that there comes a point where you're like, people should let you live your life or let you be you. Like I've been on exposed sites and all kinds and I'm like, you don't even know me. Yeah, like I'm on those sites too. Yeah, I'm like, you don't even know me. So let me ask you this. Um from from your experiences what what would you say to someone who says that these celebrities, you know, they want people to buy their stuff or support them or whatever the case may be, um, so they just gotta deal with all the stuff that come. Like, what would you like? What kind of conversation? What would you say to a person who who has that mindset that all celebrities should just deal with it? They famous, they get money, they just need to deal with whatever come with that. I've never agreed with that. I've never agreed with it, and. I was so excited to finally meet some celebs because it was like I could let them see that I'm one of them people that got your back. Like I feel you, I feel you, I feel y'all. You know what I'm saying? Y'all have y'all. Okay, so y'all personal life is your personal life, and as a matter of fact, I'm working on a song right now that's talking about that because I'm so tired of people feeling like. They can live your life for you just because you make music and they're buying it. You're buying the music because you love the music. Where did the part come in where you have to know my whole life? Mm -hmm. The bios, I don't agree with the bios. Let me tell you, when I was doing bios, I had to go back and look at other people's bios and the one that stood out the most to me was Trey Songs because he's from here, from Virginia. And I was like, damn, you gotta put your whole life you got to put you was in a single parent home or that your parents traveled and one was it. You know what I mean? You got to put your whole life in there to make people. It's almost like you have to not really saying in his situation, but a lot of them are sad cases. Like when you look at the behind the music and everything like that, you're looking at their tragedies when they're on drugs and different things. It's like people. That's why they call them fans. It's short for fanatics because people really want to know with your whole reason. life just to be feel like they connected to you a little more than when they felt connected to you when they heard the song. Like you heard the song, so now you feel connected, but it's like now they don't want to put that boundary up between you as a person, like being in the malls, for instance. For my birthday, we was in Atlanta and my sibling and her friends, they had seen um, Candy from Escape. And they were super excited because, you know, she had been on Love and Hip Hop and everything like that. They've been watching. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably knew went to shows. I mean, because they was those type of chicks that do all that type of stuff. So, and this was their first time in Atlanta. And here we are. I'm like, y'all, don't try to approach her. You must know she was crazy or something. <laughs> <laughs> I know the fake smile. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, I'm like, don't. They like, she, I'm... <laughs> First thing she said was, why are these people from Richmond here? So you know that let me know that she know who I am. And if you don't know who I am, how you know? Just from looking at 804? Because mm -hmm. I had my Mona J 804, so you know 804 is Richmond? 
You know what I mean? But she made that comment, so everybody kind of felt some type of way, and I was like, so I stood to the side, let them have it a couple seconds, because I already knew that they was about to get shut down, and she's, I think she was pregnant at the time, because this was just, what, last year? Yeah, so I think she was pregnant last year around this, around March. So she was in the ice cream shop with I think her daughter and I think her boo at the time, because I know they married now, but her boo at the time was kind of over a little bit or whatever. And they was just like, man, I just want a picture real quick. And she just was like, mm, no. <laughs> and I was like, so you know now my family mad. So you know now why I'm mad. So you know what I did. I took it to Twitter. <laughs> I took it to Twitter. I had to. I had, yeah, I had to. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to download all of the tweets because I got some hot and heavy stuff didn't happen on Twitter. There, I'd have been cussed out by some majors and blocked by some, and because I'm not afraid to speak my mind. It's like y'all gotta live a fake life. I don't. And that kind of go right back to your question, like about them having to be their characters and stuff like that. Like, that's what the fans expect. They expect you to be in character 24-7, and they feel like they spend their money. They spend $100 for a ticket to come to your show, and all they want is a picture, maybe touch your hand, maybe give you a hug. You may be germaphobic. They might be different things, you know, but it's kind of hard to deal with that sometimes when you just need that one moment with your family because your family getting tired of it. Your family didn't choose that life. It chose you, but it, your family didn't choose it. So sometimes it's just not fair. And they might not have seen their family in a while. Exactly. So exactly. Fun. Especially with the major artists, they spend a lot of time from their loved ones for y'all. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So give them a break. You know what I mean? Does it bother you that people might know more of Mona J, the controversial side behind you, opposed to your music? Does that ever bother you? Um, it don't bother me, but I pay attention to it. You know, I acknowledge it. Um, a lot of people say they're intimidated by me because of the things that I post and things like that, and then the things that I say in in your face. Mm -hmm. So, but it's is that's just me. <laughs> I mean, I just gotta put the real out there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like people. That's the problem that we're having right now with the industry and really with life is because people don't want to accept the truth. You know what I mean? So it's like, I know they battle with that controversial side of me and that's the reason why they probably don't want to work with me because they know that I'm going to put the truth out there. But it's like, it depends on what it is. You know what I mean? If it's other artists trying to come up, I'm going to let them know, you know, what they're going to have to do to get in here. And that's what they don't want because they know a lot of it is perverse and they know a lot of it is disrespectful. They know a lot of it is more hard work than you probably ever thought that you'll put in in your entire life. It almost feel like slavery. You feel me? You lose your whole life, your whole other character. You know what I mean? People do get real caught up in the Mona J controversial side, but that's cool because I know to know me, like you will find out that there's a whole another side too that's not so controversial that you can actually sit down and talk to that'll give you advice and you know, it's just my thing. I put out so much information and then it's like people don't even respect the information. It's like they take it for what it's worth, but then they don't use it. And that's kind of irritating. So it makes me bark out. What would you say is one of the biggest misconceptions of you? Mm, that I'm just a ratchet ass hoe. <laughs> that I just go around just sleeping with everybody and anybody and recklessly. And you know where that came from? <laughs> was that from like when you first got started or it came later on? Don't I don't know because I mean It had to be something though that you put out there that made people think that uh, oh, I don't know how fast rumors travel and shit. Um look at that, get defensive, put the cards up. <laughs> um Let me ask you this, why are you thinking? Do you feel like that's something that comes because you are out moving in the limelight? Mm -hmm. They might see you take a picture with this guy in the studio with this particular eyes or just at a show hanging out, you know what I'm saying, with this particular eyes. And it's the fact that most people had that thing where she in that position because of something she didn't did. Or, you think it's more if of that? I would tell y'all this. If I did anything.